afternoon um, or good evening, depending on which part of the world you're in, more of which later. Um, and welcome to Have We Got Planning News For You? And thank you very much again uh, for joining us. Um, can I start with my usual reminder to you to consider making a charity donation in lieu of registration free? As you know by now, if you're regular viewers, charities we support include the NHS Combined Charities Just Giving page and shelter, but please do feel free to donate to a charity of your choice if you prefer. And welcome um, once again to our future YouTube viewers. Please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to get all our updates at the soonest opportunity. Um, now, on to this week's business, and our discussion topic this week is heritage and the historic environment, um, one of the most frequently arising issues in relation to planning applications and appeals. And who better to discuss this uh, with than the CEO of Historic England? Um, Duncan Wilson, who's also been the CEO of Alexandra Palace uh, and Park and the first director of the Somerset House Trust, amongst many other um, heritage related things. Duncan, welcome. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, you're on mute, but if you can unmute yourself, can you tell us where you're calling from and what you've chosen for this week's um, theme? Well, I have, uh, I'm calling from North London, aka Islington, but you kind of use that information discreetly these days. Um, <laughs> And um, my chosen theme is continuity, uh, which is a drink related theme, as I gather it's supposed to be. Um, Absolutely. But uh, really, because I think uh, well, this is going to sound a bit like thought for the day, but um, actually what's happening to us, to us at the moment has happened to us before as humanity, um, from the Black Death to the plague to um, the 1918 Spanish flu, all of which was catastrophic, but we did come through it. Um, and I think learning lessons about that, I mean, even climate change has happened before uh, with three successive ice ages. Um, so actually a sense of perspective may give people a little comfort that however dreadful things are, you know, the past has lessons to teach us. There we are. That's my homily for today. <laughs> when I did my first degree in classics and ancient history, I had drilled into me Thucydides chapter, uh, volume one, uh, chapter 22, where he talks about history being a possession forever, history repeating itself, etc. So it goes way, way, way back uh, uh, it, until, uh, well, until time immemorial. Um, now, Doug and Wolgeri having your discussion with you, as usual with our guests in the second half of the show. Mm -hmm. Ironically, for pretty much uh, the first time ever, our case update in the first half of our show doesn't include a heritage case. Almost every week, <laughs> but it's God's law. I um, believe. <laughs> um, uh, just as it's God's law, the, the week we talk about the historic environment, I'm in Dubai, as you can probably tell from the more yes. perceptive from my backdrop but more on that uh, later um do however of course uh, feel free to comment if you, if you think there's anything you'd like to comment on in the first half of the show and i may extend the usual invite to our viewers to, to post any questions you may have um, for duncan in the q a as well as usual comments and banter so let's introduce the panel i'm not sure we've got paul i know paul had a few issues um he'll be joining us shortly if he's not already but um starting as always with mary in the now familiar cook gallery um <laughs> <laughs> good evening good evening good evening everybody uh hello my name's mary cook i'm in the woods in wandsworth but in the uh, in the art gallery uh, in the front room in wandsworth uh and uh, i wish you all a very good evening i'm from town legal and I am, in terms of continuity, I'd like everybody to appreciate that I've squeezed into one of my favorite jackets, which is, I reckon, 18 years old. So that's my continuity. And I have got a very nice bottle of Nye Timber. We are all drinking something English. And this is a lovely, lovely uh, it's described as an elegant wine with a generous creamy texture and luscious notes of lemon pastry. So uh, I, I commend this to uh, ah. all of our listeners. Fantastic, it's a fantastic wine. Well, thanks, thanks, Mary. Now we, we would normally go to Paul, but in his absence, let's go to Sasha. Sasha, how are you, mate? I'm very well, thank you, Charlie. I feel slightly mundane being in the wilds of Oxfordshire compared to where you're phoning <laughs> it from. And um, yeah, I'm in Oxfordshire and I, in the spirit of continuity, I'm wearing my Arsenal shirt. Dunk and I are the last two fans left on this planet who have any degree of semblance <laughs> of confidence. We're going to put ourselves through the torture of eight o'clock of watching us try and score a goal. But, um, <laughs> 
you live in hope in, as a football fan. <laughs> uh, Chris, how, how are you? Hello, Charlie. I am absolutely fabulous this week. I am so excited. You know what? Those clever scientists have produced a vaccine that the government have approved. And I am really, really happy about that. That is the route back to normality. So well done, those scientists. Now, Heritage is easy for me because, as you know, I'm in Hogwarts Castle. It's thousands of years old. Grade one listed, a huge and extensive setting in case anybody was thinking of putting any development anywhere in the grounds. Uh, registered park and uh, Quidditch pitch, um, uh, scheduled ancient monuments, and um, uh, nobody's coming anywhere near this. And in line with the theme, I am drinking this. Now this is Chapel Down, oh, and I did it. a case, and I won a case for a really lovely client called Simon Vasada, and he brought me, ah, and he brought me some English wine, and I thought oh, he wasn't that impressed then. Uh, but actually, it is absolutely <laughs> delicious. And what he bought me was a bottle of Kit's Cotty, which is actually named after a scheduled ancient monument in Kent. And it was the most fabulous white wine I've had. Now I can't get that in Waitrose at the moment, and so instead I'm drinking Chapel Down. This, do you know what he said to me? He said, he said, Christopher, that's how champagne used to taste proper champagne and I said I said look Simon I'm from Droitwich okay I don't know what proper champagne used to taste like but you know what this is absolutely fabulous and we're celebrating the vaccine I'll keep it coming Chris I've got about 500 quid's worth of shares in Chapel Down so you've inadvertently given me a, a nano fraction of a penny um, so thank you for that well I'm Charlie Banner the official international correspondent of the week <laughs> uh, left the United Kingdom on the eve of the lockdown whilst it was still legal and had done um, three inquiries an EIP and a court hearing from my um, my retreat in Stockholm uh, reunited with family at the weekend in Kiev um, and decided that after I'd absented myself to do lots of hard work for for three weeks they deserved a holiday so uh, we went from Kiev to Dubai um, and that was initially only for a day but then we suddenly realized I could do my EIP from a hotel conference room whilst the family were on the beach so I am in Dubai it's somewhat ironic I, I think you're kind of trolling me team because um, when we we're in Scandinavia we had a safari theme and we we're in Dubai and it's this historic environment <laughs> the unachievable um, but I've, I've got behind me I don't know how good the view is at night but um, this is of course the Burj Al Arab um, probably the most iconic building in, in the Middle East, one of the most iconic buildings in the world. Uh, and my only contribution I can offer to continuity is that um, I think it's a fantastic building, designed by a British architect, no less, um, from Arab, I think, uh, at the time. And um, I think this is going to be sticking around for a long time, given the, the climate conditions here. And um, I dare to say if this was in the in the UK, this, this the building of this um, fabulous design, at least on the outside, it's a bit gauche inside, but it would be a... Um, strong candidate to be a list of building, even though it's modern. So um, here's, here's perhaps a heritage icon of the future. Um, I've, been doing the Brentwood I, I've been doing the Brentwood EIP from Dubai. Uh, the inspector was a little bit confused initially when one of the inspectors, when she saw my backdrop, which wasn't the verge, but um, uh, I, I, I ended up disclosing it. Um, anyway, um, we've got a, quite a lot to get through. Um, Paul's, um, oh, Paul's, Paul's viewing. He's, I think, I know you are there, Paul. Are you, are you there? At least um, you've never looked so good, Paul. Um, <laughs> steady, steady Charlie, steady Charlie. <laughs> He's in a car. He's in the dark. He's in a car. He's a man on the move. We can't hear you, Paul, but we can see you. Uh, you never sounded so good either. Uh, but uh, we'll come back to you. We'll crack on. Chris, we've got, we got, say, four um, quite meaty cases to get through. Um, and Chris, you're kicking off with the first one. I am. I am, Charlie. And uh, this is an interesting case. It's a High Court case decided last week. The name of the case is Kerry Whitehead uh, on behalf of the Cockbourne Village Association. And uh, the defendant was Sussex, Mid-Sussex District Council and Gleeson Strategic Land Limited as the developer. Now, it's a very topical issue at the centre of this case and planning right now, as both Mary and I know. It's about local authorities seeking to meet the need for gypsy and traveller accommodation um, and where there's often a lack of that, and that is a lot across large parts of the country. Um, and when application sites are identified and promoted for this type of development, they often meet a lot of opposition. And let's be frank, it's often based on prejudice against these communities for various reasons. So 
what a lot of local authorities have done is sought to suggest that when large strategic sites are allocated, and the argument is the developer says, well, these sites are needed to meet the needs, the council say, okay, well, that's fine, but you need to meet all the needs of this particular area on these sites, and that includes the gypsy and traveler need. And that's often accepted at the allocation stage, but then rejected at the application stage when the application goes in and the developer is often reluctant to provide this requirement. Now that's where we pick up the story here in Mid Sussex. Uh, they have a number of large strategic allocations in their new local plan, one of which is DP11, a strategic site on land north of Clayton Mills in Sussex. But Gleeson submitted their planning application uh, for 500 homes without any actual provision for gypsy and travellers. Now, the reason they did so was in the wording of the policy, DP11, that said, provision of permanent pitches for gypsies and travellers to contribute towards the additional total identified need within the district commensurate with the overall scale of residential development proposed by the strategic development or the provision of equivalent financial contributions towards off-site provision. So the policy offers two ways in which um, the application can comply with the requirement to meet the Gypsy and Traveller uh, provision. Um, and Gleeson submitted their application offering a financial contribution to address this to the tune of £750,000, no less. Um, and, um, and that is how they sought to provide it. And, and more than that, the council itself has ident had identified a site in the village of Cockbourne and suggested the necessary provision could be met there. Now, the good residents of Cockbourne were not happy about that. Their view was that they should challenge the planning commission on the basis of an interpretation of policy DP11. And they said that the provision should have been on site and the policy has a preference for that. So their main challenge was over the interpretation of the policy. That's why I've read it out in full. The claimant said that the policy gave a priority to on-site provision for gypsy and traveler sites, but the judge rejected that in a very short and pithy way. Um, she rejected that the policy had any form of um, uh, priority towards um, on-site provision. And that meant that uh, that argument was rejected. Another basis of the argument, or another way in which it was put, was to say that the officer's report um, hadn't drawn relevant material considerations to the members' uh, attention. And in particular, it said it was misleading for not alerting the members to the option of reducing the number of houses. Gleason's argument is they could only get 500 houses and the other facilities on um, if the site was used in the way they proposed. And that didn't make provision for Gypsy and Traveller provision. And what the, um, the, local the local parish council said, the action group said, well, they should have looked at reducing the number of um, conventional houses and partly because of uh, requirements um, in relation to um, uh, the Equalities Act. And the judge again rejected that and said there's no preference there and the officer's report was comprehensive and dealt with it sufficiently. There were other arguments, but in the four minutes available, I can't say any more than that. Paul Brown was defending, he defended successfully again for um for a local authority we'll see paul has had a very busy time of late um and he was successful here again can i just say chris you're such a pro to be able to keep on going paul looks like he's on a on a roller coaster I've been struggling to, to avoid giggling. I should say before I, I hand over to Mary for the next lot, I am I'm in a beach bar uh, on the beach. It's a rule uh, to being a, being a panellist in this show that you have to do at least one show on the beach. And I'm out trying to out Chris Chris today, but um, I'm stealing a, a seat that's been booked by somebody else. So I'm going to get unceremoniously kicked out at the moment, but I have, uh, I've set myself up on a, on a sunbed nearby, albeit in the night, to continue. So um, anyway, oh, uh, on that note, <laughs> over to Mary. Mary, you're going to tell us um, when is it time for, for a litigant to take no as an answer? Um, that was the question the Court of Appeal polled, posed, and you're going to tell us what they said. Indeed, indeed. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, <laughs> Uh, the idea of you on a sunbed I find somewhat distracting. However, back to the Court of Appeal. So this is Sir Keith Lim Limblom 
And indeed, he started his judgment by saying that the question in the appeals was, uh, put at its simplest, was whether, uh, when, sorry, should an unsuccessful litigant uh, accept no for an answer? And really, I mean, this is one of those cases that one dreads being on the other end of. It really is. Mm. So uh, it's all about uh, the challenge to two permissions that were granted by Canterbury City Council in relation to two sites. And one of these sites was known as the Chislet site. So the Chislet site was promoted through the local plan. The other site, known as the Hopland site, was not. Both of these sites were in close proximity to SPA, SSSI and SACS. And so when the planning applications came through in relation to these sites, they both had uh, HRA, uh, Habitat Regulation uh, assessments. And in July 2017, the Hopland site was granted outline permission. And following that, it was sold to Red Row. That application was accompanied also by an ES and, as I say, a Habitats Regulation Assessment. And then in April 2018, can Mr Tucker mute himself? Yes, thank you. In April 2018, if you remember, the CEUJ court came out with their people over wind judgment. And that was the point about you had to exclude mitigation in considering whether an appropriate assessment was needed. In November 2018, the council granted outline consent for the second site known as the Chislet site, having done an HRA assessment and concluded that with mitigation in place, no adverse effect would, take, would, would, would occur. And again, there was an ES, and again, the ES looked at cumulative impacts of both the schemes. In January 2019, that there was a challenge to the Chislet Outline Planning Permission on the basis that the council had made an error in treating these two applications as separate projects. Remember that that, that line of cases about salami slicing uh, and uh, in, in the context of e, EIA assessments. Permission to proceed was given on that ground. Those proceedings failed in the summer of 2019 when Mrs. Justice Lang, as she then was, found that there, they were indeed two separate projects that the council had considered if they were one project and lawfully concluded that they were not. And there was an, a, an attempt in the course of those proceedings to challenge the cumulative assessment, but that wasn't allowed. And there were some very pithy observations, both in the court below and in the court of appeal about the need for lawyers and claimants to exercise constraint and not to seek to amend their grounds through, for example, replies and skeleton arguments. That's quite an important uh, theme in this case. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Red Row in, 20, in February 2019 submitted reserve matters approvals on their site. And again, before doing so, uh, they submitted a habitats regulation assessment and they concluded that with mitigation measures there would be no adverse effects. Now in the, in the very same month the same claimant sought to cha challenge the Red Row reserved matters application on the basis that there hadn't been a proper habitats regulation assessment undertaken at that stage Secondly, that there hadn't been a proper habitats regulation undertaken at the outline stage because the one that was undertaken was defective because it took into account mitigation in accordance with the then English authorities. And th this second claim was dealt with by the same judge, rolled up hearing, judge found that the outline permission, this is interesting, was not a nullity that the habitats regulation assessment at the reserve matters stage was a proportionate and effective remedy to the defective HRA at the outline stage. And that even if she was wrong about that, she would not have granted them relief because the outcome would have been exactly the same had they got the habitats regulation assessment right at the outline stage. So the judge heard both cases one after another, dismissed them, refused leave, uh, sorry, refuse permission for leave to appeal to the Court of Appeal. And Red Row got on with developing their site. 
Meanwhile, the uh, claimant, uh, the unsuccessful claimant tried to get permission out of the Court of Appeal from Lord Justice Lewison, who ruled that there was no prospect of success on either of these cases and refused to uh, grant leave for permission to bring an appeal to the Court of Appeal. In particular, the judge found that the, the judge below was not obliged to treat the outline consent as a nullity, that applying the Wells case, it was in for the a national court to decide whether to suspend or revoke. And that, of course, the Supreme Court in Champion had held there was a dis decision not to quash the substance of the, of, of, the, of, the, of the claim. Now, by this stage, Red Row had spent some two million pounds uh, building out their scheme and uh, building out the first houses. The applicant then sought to invoke the rules, of the CPR rules 5230, which allow in exceptional cases for a final determination to be reopened. Now, there are only three bases upon which what, what this is, is allowed to happen. One, that it's necessary to do so to avoid real injustice. Two, that the circumstances are exceptional and make it appropriate. And C, there's really no alternative effective remedy. Now, the applicant went back to Lord Justice Lewison with this application. And again, Lord Justice Lewison refused. They then went back, they then reopened this effectively in front of a full court of appeal, three judges, and the Court of Appeal said that despite uh, Estelle de Holm's courageous submissions, the court had no hesitation in finding that this case or the, the cases did not fall within these uh, exceptional circumstances. And the Court of Appeal in a very withering judgment, it has to be said, noted that one case had come before the court five times, the other case had come before the courts four times, the claimant, I mean, this is, this is awful. In the Red Row case, the claimant didn't even object to the grant of permission in the first place. Um, there were no exceptional circumstances. There was no injustice to the claimant and there were no tenable grounds for appeal. And I would like to have an Oscar awarded for me to me to this evening for keeping a straight face in, whilst delivering that summary in what can only be described as adversity because I've got, I've got Paul Tucker looming at me and I've got Chris giggling his head off and it's absolutely it's ridiculous. I've had, I've had, I've had, I'm so, Mary, I'm so sorry, but the reason is okay. that the chat, the, the Q&A, people are talking about Paul thinking he's in Bohemian Rhapsody <laughs> of Wayne's World and um, it is hilarious. Can I, can I, Duncan, can I just apologise now for the riffraff that's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the comments I've had to obscure Paul's Don't face. Have a human I've had to obscure Paul's face with a post-it note because I just lost it. Uh, people are saying, uh, "What are they? Has Paul been kicked out of the family home? Has Paul been kidnapped? We could just <laughs> sit here and watch Paul swaying on the screen." <laughs> Is Paul in a taxi home after a big night out? I seriously, I think Paul's in a bad way, and that was a cry for help. Uh, is Paul driving to pick Charlie up? Someone, someone put Paul in the boot. Oh dear, we could go on all night. Anyway, I've done many a strange thing in my life, um, but I think this is probably the first time anyone has sought to summarise a judgment of Mr. Justice Holgrave to a backdrop of techno DJ music. But but here we go. Um, I'm going to talk about the Flaxby Park um, decision of Mr. Justice Holgrave. Right. Yet another um, epic um, from him, 60 pages, 240 paragraphs. It was a challenge to the Harrogate um, local plan produced by Harrogate Borough Council in March of this year. Policy DM4 of that plan provided for a new settlement uh, within what was described as a broad location uh, for growth in the um, Great Hamilton or Catal area, the details of which were to be left significantly to be established through a subsequent new settlement development plan document. The claimant was the promoter of land at Flaxbury, which was promoting an alternative new settlement on their land. And there were three grounds 
uh, in general terms, two of which are based on the Strategic Environmental Assessment Directive and regulations um, concerning sustainability appraisal, and one of which related to viability. Um, now, the, the lengthy judgment uh, uh, and complex factual background means I'm sense bound to oversimplify in the few minutes that I have. But in short, what happened was that an early iteration of the sustainability appraisal accompanying the 2016 consultation draft of the plan included the Flaxbury alternative proposal as a reasonable alternative option. But later it was sieved out principally on transport and accessibility grounds and not considered um, as a reasonable alternative to the Great Hamilton uh, proposal as a broad location. The first um, aspect of the case considered by Mr Justice Holgate um, was uh, the complaint by the claimant that there wasn't a comparative environmental appraisal in the SASEA process of the two proposals, Great Hamilton and Flaxby. Flaxby had been ruled out based on a standalone assessment of its accessibility transport issues and wasn't subject, so the claimant said, to a comparative like-for-like uh, -like assessment against uh, Great Hamilton. And in advance of this ground, the claimants relied on a judgment of Mr Justice Oosley a few years ago in the Heard and Broadland case, which had been taken as indicating that where reasonable alternatives were taken forward, um, they had to be the subject of a like-for-like -like comparative environmental assessment. Mr Justice Holgate didn't agree, and he held in particular in the light of the Court of Appeal judgment in uh, the Heathrow or Plan B litigation, which held that the quality of a sustainability appraisal or environmental report could only be challenged on Wensbury grounds, i.e. it was beyond the range of reasonable sponsors. He held in light of that, there was no, at least now, no mandatory requirement for a like-for-like -like and comparative assessment. It's a matter of evaluative judgment for the authority whether one was needed. Now, that's a clear departure from the Heard case and, and therefore quite, quite some significance in changing understanding. I think, to my mind, the legal watershed was probably the Heathrow judgment, but there's welcome clarity that that like-for-like -like assessment wasn't needed. The second and third grounds of challenge, Mr Justice Holgate considered rated of viability. Late in the EIP process, the Flaxby uh, proposers identified an additional 600-odd hectares of land which was available for that site. It wasn't assessed by the council in any great detail in the site assessment. Mr Justice Holgate said that, that was no error of law, that there was an evaluative judgment and there were rational reasons for concluding that a full and detailed assessment of that lately put forward additional error was, was uh, uh, not needed. The third ground alleged uh, insufficient information um, before the inspector for him to conclude, I think it was him, that the Great Hamilton proposal was viable and that was rejected. This is an important aspect of the case. The crux of his reasoning was that um, the LPN inspector were entitled to conclude that this is because the proposal was a broad location. The de details of which were to be left to be established in the DPD, including mix, infrastructure, quantum, site boundaries, etc. And the inspector took the view, and in Mr Justice Holgate's uh, view, uh, reasonably so, that therefore only a high-level viability assessment was needed, uh, a broad understanding only to use the language of every part of the PPG as opposed to de greater detail. And that sort of two-stage approach, principle first, details in a DPD later, um, was what seems to me to have won the day for this new settlement. Uh, in comparison, for example, to the North Essex and Uttlesford approaches of trying to deal with a lot more grand granularity through the plan, which led to a much finer grained viability um, scrutiny, uh, which, which scuppered uh, a couple of the uh, proposed garden settlements now. So um, uh, it's some powerful lessons there. Um, one successful ground, uh, which was largely a Pyrrhic victory, that was that the results of the environmental statement um, had to be taken into account before um, the adoption found by the decision maker and that meant by the full council under the relevant legislation and related to local government it couldn't be delegated gisting was fine so you don't have, the members don't have to read all the consultation responses but the full council haven't considered it there it's an important lesson for local government um you've got a, the adoption has to be considered by full council it was therefore remitted uh, permission to appeal hasn't been sought so that's the last word uh, we'll leave it there and paul over to you if you're uh, out of the boot or the back of the cab or wherever you are in um, to tell us about um, the Blackbirds Farm energy case. Um, hello Charlie and uh, can I apologise to uh, all of our, uh, our our viewers for for what has been a chaotic afternoon. Uh, I, I'm the traffic correspondent out of Liverpool and Liverpool is officially shut. Uh, that's officially shut uh, on the basis that it takes two and a half hours to get out and then the M6 uh, is uh, shut. So, which is why I'm stuck somewhere in a back lane, somewhere near Ormskirk, with my wife uh, driving us desperately to try and get home. So, apologies for the, the chaos and the bouncing up and down and the sickness. So, my case relates to Blackburn's Farm. 
it's a relatively straightforward case, as is typical. It involves waste. Um, it, it's a case where consent was granted back in 2019 uh, for composting at a, at a farm. A relatively small scale was consented before there. It was 8,000 8, tonnes per annum. Uh, the 2019 consent was for an increase of more than three times uh, that amount, uh, and it was objected to by the local residents. I feel sorry for the local residents because the purpose of the composting was to spread the green waste, including what was described as dog waste, uh, around the fields, which went around the, the third party home. But the argument revolved around uh, heavy goods vehicles and the impact on amenity. Uh, it, it was following a, a high court case which concluded that waste uh, issues are in fact inappropriate developments in the green belt. And as usual, uh, I have been given the rubbish case and I'm happy to sign off as quickly as that because I'm sure people want to listen to Duncan far more than looking at the lay-by on the God knows what A road in God knows what part of Lancashire. And I wish <laughs> I was with you listening to techno music, Charlie, um, but God bless our, view, our viewers. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Absolutely fantastic. Um, right, Sasha, you're going to leave the interview with Duncan. I'm going to keep myself on mute so that uh, we get the minimum amount of techno as possible. Um, so over to you to lead our discussion. Yeah, I'm just slightly white. I've got to warm Duncan up because he spent the past half an hour thinking I was told this was a professional slip production. <laughs> And it's been like he's walked into Jerry. On the contrary, it was extremely enjoyable. <laughs> oh, Duncan. Thank you so much for coming. We're, we're truly, truly grateful for you coming on. And I, just to introduce you, you are the current chief executive of Historic England. You've had a really interesting career, as Charlie has alluded to. And I think there aren't many people who are qualified accountant who worked at the Treasury and spent significant time at Historic England. So you're a pretty unique and rare beast. Um, what I wanted to start off with, obviously the, all our audience work in the planning system on a day-to-day -day basis. How would you as chief exec summarize how you perceive and see the Historic England role in the planning system? I think our task is to champion and protect the historic environment. And that's a statutory role. Uh, although that's a paraphrase of it. Um, and, you know, we have an essentially adversarial system of which you are an important part. So somebody needs to sit on our side and say, look, this stuff is really important. W when you take a decision about it, make sure you uh, have a proper assessment of the significance of the historic environment uh, to the extent that it particularly that it's going to be affected by development or change. Um, and uh, we we have set, we've done that in various ways, and some of the later questions will come on to how, how we go about it. But I think I, I, I'm entirely unapologetic about that part of our role. I think the way we try and do it can be um, as constructive as possible in looking at how we, how we can reach agreement to to get the best of both worlds, uh, and we do try to do that. But actually. When it comes down to it, we are here to state the virtues and significance of the historic environment, which is why we have a research department and uh, an expert listing department, and why we take development planning advice so seriously. Mm. And doing an audit of the past, what would you say Historic England have got wrong and what have they got right in the past when you look back and do an audit of that nature? What's your conclusions on those two points? Well, um, I was actually at English Heritage shortly after it was formed. And of course, we were one organisation. We've split into two in 2015 when Historic England took on the, the planning and regulatory and advisory part of our role. And English Heritage carried on with running the properties. But when I was at the old English Heritage, um, well, I just remember it as being an incredibly exciting time because we got out from under government. Um, and we were able to do the best by the historic environment in a much more flexible way um, and, 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 be, and take a few more risks, actually. Um, and to some extent, the formation of Historic England in 2015 was a rebirth uh, and allowed us to do that, too. I remember um, there was always a tension between our, 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 our historic properties side 
who wanted to market the province to visitors and what is now historic England side where we had to do some quite difficult stories mm. and we had to be said, adversarial mm. um, to make the case now we don't have that potential conflict it's much easier for us to to engage with people but I think we it, it, one, one of the things we've done well is engage positively telling good stories about the history and what it can deliver as well as the more difficult ones where we're involved in a dispute over a planning application uh, and, and on that, that side the better at engaging people outside the system to let them make the, the case themselves local people um, you know we did that in Paddington for example uh, where you know it was it was more about telling people what's going on than anything else the planning system is quite arcane and quite intimidating for ordinary people to express their views about and within and I think that's a really important point incidentally in considering the planning white paper that we need to make sure that that people are signposted to how they can engage and encouraged to engage but so that those are some of the things we've done better I think some of the uh, well leaving aside individual casework some of the things maybe we, we, we've got wrong in the past we did have a reputation for being the organization that like to say no without really accounting for ourselves resting on our extreme expertise and our complicated vocabulary mm. and i have to say i have no time for that really and we don't do it nearly as much um we I, we try to explain ourselves in 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 ordinary language and i think that's a virtue and we try to engage particularly before applications come in with developers and owners so that we actually can see if we can reach a measure of agreement uh, before we get to the stage of, 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 of planning hearings and potentially appeals and all of that. Mm. And as, so as, I, yeah, sorry. As Charlie said, I mean, all five of us are involved in appeals where heritage issues are really at the forefront now. What's your view on where where the policy framework sits, in essence, NPPF, in particular 193 to 196, and the, and the kind of balance? I think the NPPF can work very well, but it can also not work very well, because it relies a lot on the judgment of the planning authority being objective about measuring quite often heritage harm against public benefit, um, and that needs to be a fair judgment and with the best will in the world you know it's going into the realm of local politics and sometimes there are particular views that are held very strongly and maybe don't allow for reasoned argument and 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 you know reaching reaching a uh, an opinion which is generally acceptable um but i have to say that you know the, that that system doesn't often work well and I think it gives a voice to local democracy which is really important actually um, and again that's something we need to carry forward into the reforms envisaged by the planning white paper and what about you've obviously got a lot of developer clients and and people who work in the development industry what's your message to those that are bringing forward development proposals that what's the message that Historic England wants to set out to them? Well, first of all, engage with us early through our enhanced advisory um, system and um, uh, pre-application advice. I, I should declare that that is chargeable at cost, but <laughs> the costs are laughably small. Um, <laughs> but actually, I, I generally, I, th I think most people, many developers would agree that it saves them a lot of money to do that. So we don't get involved in arguments further down the river, which which are become more and more intractable the further down the river you get. Mm -hmm. um, and as I say, we, we you know, now we will um, generally settle for schemes that may not deliver us everything we wanted but we feel have gone a reasonable part of the way to get most of what we wanted. Uh, and we will listen to developers to understand where they're coming from and what the most important thing for them is, whether that's to do with the financial viability of their scheme or, or what they 
what they want to deliver through their scheme, their vision for it, um, mm. so that we can, we hope, it's not always possible, but uh, have the best of both worlds. What I will also say is that we are quite willing to take things to appeal where we, in, in the few cases where we think that's absolutely justified or, or to ask for call-in. And, you know, we are more active in that sphere now. And I think that's fine because um, it's not our job to agree with everybody all the time. But at the same time, neither is it the right way to proceed to disagree on principle unless you get everything you want. And then, and then talking about looking at the future, what, what are your, when you kind of have moments of reflection, what do you want to see? What's the future roadmap that you want to see Historic England fulfil? Well, what I would like is for us to engage. I mean, we, we have been um, exploring something called the public value framework within our organisation to try and measure all our activities against, well, what do they actually deliver in terms of not just outputs, but outcomes? And how does that benefit the public? Because after all, we are mainly funded by the public. Um, and how can we explain that? And actually, there is a degree of self-interest in that because the Treasury is quite interested in that kind of approach. Um, now, what I want to be able to do is to translate that into um, much wider engagement uh, with much more diverse audiences. Um, one type of diversity we're not particularly good at is engaging with young people. Um, you know, I've got three children myself. Uh, I know the challenges. <laughs> we don't speak the same language. I don't know how to, you know, I, I'm about a third as adept as they are at anything to do with IT. And all, all of that counts. Um, so, uh, but I think that's the only way we will effectively champion and protect heritage is by making sure those audiences mm. understand and agree. And of course, we've got to be technically adept and, you know, deal with the sort of issues and, and occasions which you deal with too. Um, and uh, we need expertise. We want to be risked and authoritative, but we will not do that by sheltering in our ivory tower and writing extensive essays in effect to ourselves. Okay, and can I just finally, before I hand it over to my fellow panellists, can I just finally ask, which building that's got consent do you find the, the biggest affront to our planning system in terms of your 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 kind of consideration? What building irritates you? Where, were my lawyer sitting with me, he would now clamp his hand across my mouth. But he's not. <laughs> but he's not. So I think I can say the walkie-talkie. Yeah, yeah, it's Which funny. Building, I, I, we advised was ugly, mm. and everybody criticised us for that. Mm. But if you look through Tower Bridge, I have to say, I think you'd have to say that was a mistake. Mm. But it's with us for a very long time. So, okay. And on a happier note, what's the building? What's your favourite building? What new building or yes, or, new building of the past of the past twenty five years. Oh, right. Well, I actually like the Reichman Tower mm. in Canary Wharf. I think that's a very good building. I think it's been rather spoiled by what happened afterwards. Mm. But um, I was at Greenwich at the Old Royal Naval College, so it's a building with which I am quite familiar. And I think there was a mistake made, which is I think it wasn't put on the grand axis of symmetry deliberately because it was felt it would distract, it would um, sort of dominate it. But actually, if it had been, we could have had a proper cluster in Canary Wharf, which I think architecturally would have sat a lot better, great axis that Canaletto painted and Wren designed. Anyway. No, absolutely. Uh, oh, absolutely. Right, Mary, I believe you've got a question for Duncan. I do have a question for Duncan, and my question is, is prompted by my experiences um, at Inquiry, but also this week looking at Hackney's uh, new local plan. And my question is this, is the approach to non-designated heritage assets, which certainly in Hackney's local plan is treating them on a par with designated heritage assets, right, is one of, is one of my questions. Particularly when we bear in mind that we have national policy, which is seeking to optimize and make best use of um, land. Hmm. That's my question. Um, should we not recognise yeah, that? Should, is, should there not be a distinction between 
non-designated and designated heritage assets? Well, there is one. I mean, I can't answer for Hackney's local plan because I haven't, I must confess, read it. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the different levels of protection are given to designated heritage assets mm. in the NPPF. Uh, what I would say is that I think our system is very good at protecting individual things, assets. Um, what it's not so good at is protecting the character of historic places um, and that's where sometimes non-designated heritage has come or indeed public sets which is not it may not teach characteristics but is the setting for a lot of heritage assets and i have to say in in covid a lot of what, what a lot of people have valued and missed is uh, and, and actually to some extent appreciated more because of their confinement at home and being able to you know being being uh, uh, to take their exercise just walking within walking distance of their home is the character of those places um so I, this isn't really a i'm afraid a, a proper legal answer to your question mary but, don't don't, don't um, worry but i agree with you that i certainly agree with you that covid has has uh, awoken our eyes to our own local environment and that we perhaps uh, are now spending more time locally and we're cherishing the best of what we have locally. I, I definitely agree with that. Thank you. Yeah. Right, Paul. Have and you... we have a, we have a, no, you, you move on probably your best. <laughs> I, was, I was just going to refer to our high streets programme, which the government has put a significant amount of extra money into for us. Um, and we're working in 69 high streets over the whole country. Now this is a, that challenge has grown immeasurably in the last six months, but it's a challenge we all have to face. Mm. So what do we want to happen to our historic town centres to make them still thriving and places what people want to come to? Because very often that's where people get their only sense of being part of a community. But if, if the retail's changing dramatically, what can we do? I don't have a straightforward answer, but we are very determined to try and see Seek one, it would be different in each place. Paul? Uh, hello, Duncan. Um, my, my question relates to archaeology. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah, my question relates. <laughs> That's astonishing. I mean, to, uh, but my question relates to archaeology. So, paragraph 189 of MPPF talks about having the requisite amount of information where there's uh, uh, archaeological interest and, where necessary, a field evaluation. Um, there's been a recent appeal in Stannington up in Northumberland, which has indicated that mm -hmm. field evaluation can be appropriate in advance of the determination of an application, even where there isn't proven archaeological remains uh, on the site, but just nearby. Is that the right way forward? Well, archaeology is a real problem. And again, I should mention the new planning white paper because it, it needs to be addressed. There's a recognition that it does but it doesn't lend itself to prior um, desk-based evaluation. That's an important part of it. Desk-based evaluation can tell you what the historical records show was there. What it can't tell you is what is still there. Now, I, I've, I've been involved, or we've been involved in three Shakespearean theatres discovered in London recently, where we knew the site of the theatre, but we imagined on fairly good evidence that it had all been dug away and in each case it was astounding survival which you couldn't have anticipated other than by um, field archaeology in advance so we need to deal with that somehow uh, because otherwise the whole principle which I do understand and endorse of giving developers more certainty about planning applications which are a very expensive process will be kind of blown apart because we will find something unexpected and then there'll be a question of what to do with it uh, and we can't really have it all dug up in the bucket of a digger there will be outrage i was at english heritage when before ppg 16 and i was then their financial controller back in the 80s late 80s early 90s and i had to write a check for a million pounds to the developer of the rose theater which was an unexpected discovery. Um, even more unexpected was that Judy Dench threatened to lie down in front of the bulldozer. 
uh, which would have been an interesting face off, really. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, the, um, uh, you know, that, that was absolutely the old way that this happened. And I think the, the, the system of developer pays and PPG 16 was, has, has been extraordinarily successful. But we must make sure we don't lose that at the same time encouraging the developer to obtain more certainty and and you know the obligation on us to to make sure the, the historic environment records are up to date and digitized well actually the obligation is with each local authority but that has to be taken more seriously can i just ask you in relation to ppg 16 do, do you feel that current guidance has watered down the the, the hugely successful regime we operate under ppg 16 um well not not really but it is a risk with with whatever emerges from the, the planning white paper right and, and it is this risk of unexpected discoveries and how do you deal with them thank you right chris you've got a question i have i have duncan i completely and utterly support everything that um is done to protect heritage in this country i'm sat in a listed building i'm sat in a conservation area i'm sat in regency cheltenham and what people love about Cheltenham, and we've got a thriving high street, now we've come out of lockdown, really busy. People love the experience. Don't, yeah. don't ever let us lose that. And the work that you do is fantastic. And the work that individual conservation officers do in each authority mm -hmm. is so, so important. It is criminal that some authorities don't have a conservation officer in what is undoubtedly the finest conservation and heritage portfolio and canvas in the world. Um, and that's my view about that. Um, but my question is to get off planning a little bit and um, just open up heritage to a wider issue, which is the new Agricultural Act came onto the statute book just a month ago. Uh, Agricultural Act 2020 replaces the common agricultural policy with a single, and we're gonna get used to this phrase, ELMS, Environmental Land Management Scheme. And mm -hmm. farmers are going to be rewarded, I think, quite rightly in this country and land managers with providing environmental public goods. And Chapter 1, Part 1, Section 1C for the enthusiast specifically identifies our cultural heritage as a public good, which is terrific. And my question really is, to what extent are farmers and DEFRA involved in the protection of our cultural heritage? And do you think that's going to change under the ELMS system? Well, we've had reassurances on that. You're right to point out the positive references in the Agriculture Act. Unfortunately, there are none in the Environment Act, which followed it. Uh, and we were told repeatedly that this wasn't intended in any way to downplay heritage. But it is somewhat worrying that all the parliamentary debate has been about the natural environment and none about the historic, although questions have been asked. Um, that said, uh, I mean, what the, the support that flows through DEFRA to farmers to maintain heritage is incredibly important. We reckon that since um, uh, 2009, 320 million has been spent on heritage through that. Wow. Wow. Um, which is more than we've spent, uh, obviously, with the lottery. Uh, you know, the, there is a lot more goes through the, the lottery. But um, and uh, that is through, through uh, environmental and countryside stewardship schemes. So essentially, um, I would say, as with, with, with um, any other form of heritage protection, it's a mixed picture. Some farmers are incredibly proud of what they find. I remember we did a, some aerial photography last summer because it was quite dry. Um, and um, I mean, the summer before, um, and we, there was a farmer on the Today program um, with me, I think, and he was talking about us having discovered a Neolithic cursus running the double one, running across one of his fields. And he was almost in tears about how proud that made him feel and how he wanted to protect it and, and make sure you know, he plowed more shallowly over the cursus. Um, and he hadn't known about it at all before. Well, we hadn't either. Um, and you know that illustrates the best of it. Uh, but of course, agribusiness and margins and doesn't always sit with heritage protection. So uh, it is really important that the ELM scheme picks that up. Um, 
if you're talking about an Iron Age hill fort, uh, you can't protect the butterflies and the birds without protecting the hill fort itself. It would be crazy. And so often they go together. Um, so it's really important that that does come through into good law. Mm. And good okay. regulation. Charlie, Charlie, what's your question for Duncan? Yes, actually, I'm going to ask a question from the audience. Lots of great questions from the audience, but one theme um, that come up it is really embodied in Bridget Rosewell's question, uh, asking Duncan to comment on the balance between built uh, and uh, landscape environment and how we can show that new buildings can be beautiful. And can I piggyback onto that, an observation of my own, that um, most of our heritage assets in the UK um, were built before planning regulation. Yeah. And yet, um, uh, if they had come forward after planning regulation, an awful lot of them would have been refused on landscape grounds. I mean, can you imagine the Glivia 3 uh, landscape and visual impact assessment of Blenheim Palace? The major impact, major <laughs> adverse impacts all over the place. Um, I have had a, a developer in the city of London tell me St Paul's wouldn't have got consent because it was a tall yeah, building. Exactly. I, had, I had to point out to him that the building that came before was taller. Yes, well, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, a fire helped with that, didn't it? Yeah. But what, what's, what's going wrong? Uh, and, and what can be done to, if there is something going on in your view, you know, how can we strike the correct balance? Um, well, I think it is about quality of design, quality of build. Um, what, is, what seems to me the most important thing is we now have the facility to throw up buildings very quickly and very cheaply to a great height. Uh, whereas previously, you know, these things took 30 years. You probably had longer to consider them. Uh, and, uh, you know, the impact was, was, was gradual. But we can now do something like, you know, that, and, and where it's been particularly um, difficult in my, uh, in my experience is, for example, where we have the Westminster World Heritage Site, but tall buildings in Southwark, uh, which, which impact on Westminster significantly. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about anything current, but previously. Um, and yet the decision is made by one borough and, and inevitably the impact on the, the, the adjacent borough will not be given as much prominence. That's why it's so important that, that the City of London produces its own strategy for the cluster. Uh, I mean, I know that they're under a lot of commercial pressure as always, but the cluster seems to be a bit amoeba-like uh, depend, you know, and, and uh, it would be good to have some proper strategic definition, some strategic planning in London, uh, um, exercised by the GLA. The new um, mm -hmm. plan is a lot more, um, uh, pays a lot more attention to, to heritage in place than the last one, but, um, you know, so that's a positive development. Um, so I think uh, I'm, I've now got lost in my own answer, really. Um, in terms of, uh, you, you, were, you were really asking about why, why, why can't we build new beautiful places? Well, I think we can. And actually uh, the work, at your, your previous speaker, Nicholas Boyer smith as chairman of the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission has a lot to say about this, much of which I agree with, um, that we can build those kind of places, but we can't always build them to deliver the maximum profit which is where the planning system comes in. Duncan, can I finish with a final question, which quite a few of our audience have asked us about, and that is Historic England's position, obviously on the questions, the very important questions of diversity mm. and heritage uh, and the philosophy of explain and retain. Is that a, an approach that you're going to keep for the near future, or do you think there's going to be a more proactive approach a bit like the National Trust in relation to heritage assets that do have a slightly questionable background? Well, we actually, we've, we've stated our policy as retain and explain. And I think that is, you know, if, if, if anybody sticks up for retaining our heritage, it should be us. Mm -hmm. But we do recognise there's a serious problem. I think there's also an argument that you get rid of it. I mean, Colston is now gone. Um, who will be talking about the plinth in a year's time whereas if the statue had been there and had been had a you know a really powerful counter memorial uh to make the point maybe maybe the issue would be more more 
debated, more current in people's minds. I do understand the hurt that's caused by some of these memorials, but I also think we need to look at them kind of objectively and rationally. So many of these figures are famous for a number of different things and their connection with slavery is only just coming to light. That needs to be made clear. It really does. But uh, I don't think it's the only thing to say about them. And so I think we need to say it loud and clear and use whatever techniques we are at our disposal to tell that story more effectively. But I think um, demolishing them or putting them out of view would, would make all of that debate disappear. And I think that would be a retrograde step on the whole. Okay. On, a po on a positive note, on a positive note, that, that whole issue has led to young people engaging it with heritage issues in a in a whole new way. And I, I mean, there is a positive to come out of all of that. I agree with that. Look, all the, those three Victorian generals in Trafalgar Square uh, were completely anonymous until now, mm -hmm. and actually asking questions about what they did and their past um, is really important. Yeah, um, absolutely. Anyway. Well, Duncan, thank you so much for coming on and being such a brilliant oh. guest. Thank you so much. Charlie. Um, thanks, uh, Sasha. Well, it's me and Kylie, actually, if you can hear her in the background. Um, I'm doing Champion of the Week. Um, and my champion, something I touched upon um, uh, last week, actually, is the various campaign groups who've been pressing for a reinstatement of the former railway line between Stratford and Honeybourne uh, in Worcestershire and Warwickshire, um, which would link uh, Stratford uh, and development at and around Long Marston with the Cotswold main line from, from London to Hereford, uh, which would obviously link up Stratford to Oxford and Worcester, as well as linking the Cotswold main line with Birmingham. Uh, and in recent days, um, the National Infrastructure uh, Strategy uh, announced that funding has been granted for an economic impact uh, study of these proposals, which is a crucial step towards making them a reality. And I think it's a great idea, personally. It would provide a real boost to connectivity in this part of the Midlands and beyond. So, so bravo to them. They're my champions of the week. And Mary, but Charlie, you're... Charlie, ju just as Paul complains, I parked my car in the bit where that line joins Cheltenham Station. So ah. I'm not I'm not. I'm not best pleased, to be honest. <laughs> too, much, too, much too much information. <laughs> Mary, who's your nudge? My nudge is to all of the listeners, because today there was a consultation announced on housing delivery and new public sector infrastructure. And what the government is doing is suggesting that uh, the new Class E development will have extended permitted development rights to become... C3. So this is in potentially, Duncan, some of the answer to what's going to happen to our high streets. The government is saying some of it can be repurposed for residential to bring new life and activity in. So you've got 21, you, uh, sorry, you've got until the 28th of January to respond to that consultation. So that's a nudge to you to do that. Um, thank you. Thanks, Mary. There's at least one person listening who uh, who will, will be wanting to want a conversation with me about that um, uh, because, yeah, it's, it's of quite real importance to, uh, to some cases and indeed to the economy. Um, well, that, that concludes this week's uh, episode. Um, thanks very much to, for joining us, uh, dear viewers, and particular thanks, of course, to Duncan, firstly, for coming on the show and sharing um, you know, such fascinating insight and stimulus, and secondly, for being so patient as Chris and I were cracking up <laughs> at, at Paul's uh, wonderful journey which i'll tell you what it's a personal highlight for me. Home by next week's episode oh dear. Uh, <laughs> it's been a I'd... pleasure i would raise my glass to you but if you did so in return you'd presumably get arrested so uh... <laughs> well, actually no, i'm in, I'm in one of the, the, the non-dry places mercifully so uh well i hope I i'll probably get arrested for all sorts of other things but uh but hopefully not for that charlie uh, can we I... just say can we just say that paul has very good reason to have been to liverpool he hasn't done this uh just he's got very good reason to be there for personal reasons he's not going to go into that but um he would never miss a show and uh he's been caught out by a huge waiting list at the hospital so um uh, paul we understand completely i know you're apologizing about it but you don't need to mate okay it's uh, all we're you, all Chris. living that's, human lives that's yeah. the kind of the whole point of all of this isn't it? we have a serious discussion but but we all have a bit of a laugh and, well, and, and can I the say, paul's got the only marriage in england where he can spend half an hour with his better half <laughs> shouted at i know <laughs> absolutely what, what, 
Well, can, can I say, Charlie, I wasn't given champion of the week, but had I been given champion of the week, and I don't have my script with me because I wasn't planning to be in the back of the car for this, it would have been to my wife, Ursula, for putting up <laughs> with the nonsense that I've just had to do for the last hour of <laughs> holding on and trying desperately to get in and bouncing up and down and asking to pull in when I'm asking questions. Disrespectful to Duncan, but I'm so sorry. Paul, for posterity, can we just confirm, at one stage, were you trying to get the best view from the back seat, lying yes. down on the back seat? <laughs> I was trying to work out how to get the light so it showed my face whilst not disrupting my wife driving. And I finally worked out, at one stage, I was laid prone on the back seat. Uh, well, I never had to use the sunbed. Anyway, next week... Um, uh, we're, we're dealing with custom and self-build, um, obviously a, a emerging and, and really important um, uh, issue and theme, subject of, of at least one very important decision in uh, Witchhaven District uh, recently. And who better to discuss that than the the pioneer of the custom and self-build legislation, the, the relevant act, um, uh, who is none other than Richard Bacon, MP, uh, also the founder of the All Parliamentary Group on uh, Self and Custom Build. So we're really looking forward to hearing from the, um, the original champion of Custom and Self Build on his thoughts on that subject next week. Please do, as always, um, let us know if you've got any suggestions uh, for Case of the Week, uh, for decisions of the week, for where Paul should do his journey from and to next week, um, which country I should be in next week, anything like that. We look forward Bye. to seeing you. Thank you again, Duncan. Um, over and out. Have a nice evening. Cheerio. Bye. Bye.